Hello and welcome to Too Fast, Too Forever. There's all kinds of family, we chose this one. This episode 147, Spider-Man 3 from 2007. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Joe Too. And this episode is brought to you by Sandisk. Sandisk is a brand of Western Digital for flash memory products, including memory cards and readers, USB flash drives, and solid state drives. Shout out to Sandisk. Memory. Well, shout out to Sandisk and shout out to Jake Freer for supporting us on Patreon and picking this episode for us after the break. We will be joined by the one and only Nate Milton of the Rocky Maivia Picture Show and the Kings of Sport podcast to talk about Spider-Man 3. But Joe, first, extracurricular activities. It is Thanksgiving week. What have you been up to since we last spoke? Nothing. I tried to get through the work week this week. I went and did a lot of Thanksgiving shopping, as I've said many times before. Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday, but we're having a very quiet, small Thanksgiving this year. Rachel's parents are actually on their way here. As we speak, I already got my turkey and stuff like that, and it's going to be them and us. I got tested to make sure I don't get them sick. I was really excited. Um, As you know, we just talked about this before we started recording. It was going to be a big Thanksgiving for us because, you know, I was going to get the Steelers playing the Ravens primetime Thanksgiving night, but they just announced this morning that they postponed that. But I'm still going to deep fry turkey, get drunk, and watch TV, play games do normal stuff with them so since what happened did i i I beat i finishedly i officially finished the last of us part two oh cool and like i had been sort of avowing uh for the entire time i've been playing it it is one of the best video games of all time Uh, i talked to dan the duke hayden a little bit about it after i beat it because he's like after you beat it, i want to know what you think so i talked to him a little very briefly about it uh but yeah i mean it's not a surprise that it's one of the best games of all time but if you have a ps4 or a ps5 uh, it's on sale i think 30 bucks everywhere now oh also by the way i was keeping an eye on for wells i told him about it fast and furious crossroads is 20 bucks most places right now so if you want to play that oh. on the xbox one and the ps4 uh there's also i was saying to you there's like a deluxe edition with a season pass and extra downloadable content that is not available separately i don't know what's included <laughs> in there yeah but that exists externally so there's more if you you want that so maybe we'll dive back into that well in addition to when we talk to nico and kevo in a couple of weeks about the game if there's more we might revisit the game solo just us but for now if you want to play the game if you like our episode you want to enjoy the story 20 bucks is you know depending on where you are not that much more than a movie ticket right so and you know you heard us talk about it if you listen to the episode that like there's a lot of fun time movie things in there 20 bucks feels like a nice price Yep. If you haven't gotten a chance to play it or you were waiting, I know that like, I think maybe Wes was saying he wanted to wait for it to come down in price too. And you said you talked to Wells about it. So yeah, I think 20 bucks is like a thumbs up for me. Games, I think all pretty much come down to like anywhere between 20 and 40 for Black Friday and movies come down to 10 or 15. So if you're ever unsure about something, it's always worth waiting just because it always like everything always just comes down. So yep, wait long enough and you will prosper i don't know if that's the right thing but wait and think there's, yeah trying to think Steve. if there's anything else i've been watching some of their tv shows nothing really to write home about of note just kind of knocking out shorter ones tomorrow on thanksgiving either in the morning before i go to my parents house or after i come back i'm going to start the queen's gambit on netflix which everybody's talking I've about which everybody seems yes. to love i might blow through that this weekend too that's a good idea I have been a fan of Anya Taylor-Joy since The Witch, like five years ago, right? So, like, I've been a big fan of hers for a while, so I'm looking forward to that. My friends have seen it. They all enjoy it. Everyone. So, that's good. I'm thinking if there's anything else. I don't know that there is. Uh, Mike and I put out a new episode of Cage Club on Monday. I don't remember if I mentioned one. Yeah. Oh, I didn't talk about it because there's a fast connection there that we have not talked about in the pod. No. Yes. Jujitsu is the new movie. It's fine. It's getting dragged online. Like at one point at a Metacritic of six, the CGI uh. is bad. The movie is not great, but the movie is overall okay. And I think the important thing for me and Mike is that it's a measured Nicolas Cage performance, that it is not him being over the top and goofy and memey in a way that he has been recently. Oh, so he's, he's acting. He's like actually he's acting. acting. Yeah. He's a supporting character, which is nice does a solid job here which we were very happy about but importantly for us we have in a small role very small role smaller than nicholas cage we've got rick yoon aka johnny tran so we just saw him briefly earlier this lap in 
Alita the Battle Angel in that hunter warrior bar. That's but right. here he is playing a captain in the military. He was good. I mean, he looks he looks older because it's been twenty years, but he still looks like he could play Johnny Tran right now. Like he just he's still a handsome dude, right? So like, yeah, exactly. Bring Johnny Tran back. He's not dead. We saw a body. We didn't see it. You know, he didn't tap out. Bring him back. You know, we always talk about that. Like in my dream end game of Fast and the Furious, that we get all the bosses, quote unquote, that are still alive to come back, and like they were all working for Cipher the whole time. Or something, right? Like, I would love to see Johnny Tran come back. Like, DK still out there. Johnny Tran yep. still out there. Like, let's get yep. him back, man. Carter Verone still out there. We yeah. got a lot of people out there, right? So bring them all back. Why not? I mean, if you're gonna make the ensemble cast like this and keep adding characters and like put like John Cena in them and stuff, then fuck it. Why not? What is it? What is it gonna matter at that point? Brother versus brother. Yeah, because like when you have like forty leading actors in a movie, like when you get to like seventy, it's like there's not much of a difference between right. forty and seventy. So I think that's all that I've been up to. Still waiting on Lego to send me the stickers that should be here soon. Oh, cool. Uh, Good maybe luck over the that. weekend. Who knows? I don't know. But uh, hopefully, more to report back when we record over the weekend to talk about our next thing next week. Uh, which this episode, yeah, you'll find out at the end of this episode next week's movie. So I won't spoil Ooh, that yet. But okay. yeah, uh, we have a Patreon here on the show. Too fast. Too forever.com shout out to put him first because he sponsored the episode Oops. jake freer cassie wilson ben milliman nick burris alex ellen and justin Kleiman, brian rodriguez of high school slumber party Haley gerby's Wes hampton christian larson jerry robinson dan the duke hayden renato di donato and jessica collins aka mon Tez. Thank you all so much for supporting us at the $5 level or above. If you want swag and merchandise, early access to episode, the Fast and Furious Minute document, which you're going to start expanding today with deleted scenes. Yeah. Go in-depth with deleted scenes, plus, of course, our undying love and affection, Too Fast, Too Forever.com, the best Black Friday shopping you could possibly do. Also, we said at the end of this episode, but happy anniversary today, not in real life, but on the episode to you and to Rachel. That's right. When you said, oh, this episode comes out on Black Friday, I was like, oh, shit, that's my anniversary. That's cool. So, yeah. Yep. Thank you, Coming sir. up, coming up, coming up. We also have an email address on the show, family at cageclub.me. Joe, and we've got two emails, one of which is a car picture, which we'll save. Cool. The other one, subject line, reawakening from Hector Pena. What's up, Hector? How have you been, bud? We've been doing all your car pictures. He says, sup, y'all. Missed me? Probably yes. not, but hey, who cares, right? No, we missed him. We miss everybody that writes in. We always wonder about you guys. He says, sorry for stopping and sending more emails or car pictures lately. As you know, I'm in high school, and in fact, a 12th grader as a senior. Can you believe that? Ooh. It's been a roller coaster of a final year here in Memphis. Sure. Yes, I live in Memphis, Tennessee. We're doing virtual classes. It's not a big problem for me, but on top of that, I have to help my brothers with their computers mm. when a technical problem arises. We started in September and have been going ever since. I would have written in during weekends, but shit week after shit week takes a toll on the mind. Well, that's a Sure, bummer. brother. This yeah, sucks yeah. for you. As guys that are working and a little bit older than you not that much has changed right it sucks but it's not like my life significantly changed if i was like a high school senior yep. and this ran over your senior year that would really suck so i feel for you brother that's like that's like the shittiest place in the world to be right now timeline wise so glass half full though uh with the way that the vaccines are going hopefully by whatever you choose to start next year whether that's college or you know maybe some mechanic something or other or just a whatever, job or yeah. just a gap year or whatever life might be back a little bit more to normal so this True. is a terrible year to do this in but hopefully you know for next year things will be better besides secretly college is way more fun anyway so just like I get that, like, right now it might seem like, you know, it sucks shit week after shit week, but college will be a lot more fun. Or, you know, life in general after fucking high school, so. Whenever I can, I watch some Formula One Drive to Survive on Netflix or play Gran Turismo or Dirt Rally in my PS4. I still Ooh. tune on the episodes and listen in, especially on the episodes with Nico and Kevo. He says, hopefully I saw those names right, and you did. You got them both right. To see if you all are going to do my car pictures, which we have been. We just do a randomized thing now, but I think probably about half of them are yours. Yeah, at least half, and we yeah, we were mixing it up just to make it, like, you know, a little bit fair, right? Because, like, sometimes you have, like, a block of them that come in at once, so. Yeah, plus he sent this in on Monday, and I think the episode that came out since then, we used one of his, too, so another cool. one there. Since this upcoming week of the time of the writing is Thanksgiving break, I might write in some more, but no promises. Gotta go, so as Formula One driver of Valtori Bottas would say, to my critics and to, me, to whom it may concern, fuck you. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think Formula One drivers were so spicy. I never really, like, seen their quotes 
the last time I thought about Form- Formula One driver speeches was when we were watching Turbo, right? So yeah, I, you, you have to have these personalities in like every sport now. It's all viral, baby. It's all viral. I'm glad you're back, Hector. Thanks for writing in, buddy. But that was the only email for today. If you want to email in family at cageclub.me, send in a note. We will read it on the next episode. Yes. Uh, but thank you, Hector, too, for writing in. It's been a while since you've written in, but uh, glad to hear from you. Good to hear from you. Yeah, hope, you're, hope the rest of your year goes well, brother. Hang in there. On the streets, Joe, any news about the Fastiverse? I mean, there's no real news at all generally this week because I'm still surprised that there's no, we broke the news, quote unquote, broke the news, that there's like the Wonder Woman 84 going to be on Christmas and Soul going to be on Christmas, but there's nothing for Thanksgiving. You, I would have thought, I predicted it on here, I was wrong, that there would be some kind of big VOD movie this weekend, but there's not, at least as of Wednesday when we we're recording this. I feel like Netflix has to have something up their sleeve or something, right? Let me take a look right now now at doesn't uh, it feel like there should be up? like at least like a Chappelle stand so did you hear the Chappelle brouhaha I did and I watched his um did you see like his his stand-up response about it today no so what happened with Chappelle is that both Netflix and HBO Max licensed Chappelle show to put on their services yes. except whatever the licensing deal whether it's with Comedy Central or Viacom or whatever Viacom. He's Chappelle doesn't get any of that money yeah. And he asked both of these companies, both these platforms, HBO, Warner Brothers, and Netflix to take it down. And Netflix is basically in the Chappelle business. Like all of his specials for the yep. most part yep. come out on Netflix. So Netflix is like, cool. Yeah, we're so sorry about that. We'll take it down. HBO, at least as of this morning, had not. And it's just a weird time where your name is on the show. You co-created with another dude but you don't see a dollar when somebody's getting rich off of it, right? Or if not yep. rich, at least getting paid off of it, right? So there was like a clip I saw this today of about like, it was him doing stand up recently talking about it. And he was like, I really like Netflix because I called them. And like, even though I signed the contract with Viacom, this was years ago before like streaming was a thing, right? So we obviously didn't know this was going to happen. And I called Netflix and I was like, hey, this makes me feel bad. And they were like, really? That sucks. We'll stop. And he's like, how cool was that? Like, yeah. that was the whole, like, bit. <laughs> like, isn't that cool that, like, a company, like, a businessman and, like, a company will be like, hey, that's shitty. Let's not do that. <laughs> that was yeah. his pitch today. Plus one for Netflix. You know, I was never really firmly anti or for Netflix, and that makes me a little bit happier. So in terms of new releases this weekend, there's a new HBO Max, talking about HBO Max, there's a show called The Flight Attendant with Kaylee Cuoco from Big Bang Theory, which apparently oh. is really, really good. It's gonna, I, I keep think seeing previews for this somewhere. I, I think two or three episodes are out by now, as this comes out, and I think they're putting out one episode. I think it's like a six-episode mini-season, but apparently it's very, very good. So I've not obviously seen that yet, because it's not out yet. I'm just looking at what else is coming out. There's a second one. So Steve McQueen, who directed Widows, who had done basically three movies. He had done Shame and 12 Years a Slave and yes. Widows, yeah. is doing five feature-length movies on Amazon Prime this year. That he put out one this past week, he put out one this week, and he put out Jesus. three more the rest of the year. And they're all feature-length, and they're all great supposedly i've not seen the first one yet but this it's a series called small acts okay. and this one coming out on friday is called lovers rock which as of right now has a 95 on metacritic so Jesus. okay yeah. but it doesn't seem like there's a ton other than that but i think the big tv show it's just a mini series it's not even a whole full binge thing because like seems like you can do it in an hour is that the flight attendant with kelly cuoco on hbo max so that's a thing right they saved her for that day for a reason but with no real macy's day parade yeah. only two football games now are they doing the parade tomorrow i mean like i this is going to be irrelevant by the time i'm asking you personally i think they're doing they're not doing the parade because they postponed or canceled it or something there's some i think there's something on tv but there's no actual parade from what i understand damn dude that sucks at least that's gonna throw off my whole morning session steelers canceled at night dude my whole fucking 2020 what a year in the grand scheme of things, I think you'll live through these two things. Oh, I'm I'm totally fine. Yeah, I, th- those are like the the most first world. What was the thing? Uh, it's that's a very champagne problem to have. I'm still not sure if that's exactly. Is that for sure what that means? Yeah, l- let's look it up. It needs to make a decision between alternatives that are both desirable. So that's not it. Okay. Whoops. Okay. That, it's a first world problem. It's not a champagne problem. It's like, oh, I don't know okay. whether to take out my Ferrari or my Maserati today. It's a real champagne problem. Uh. That's what that is. I don't know if I should play my PS5 or my Xbox One. Or Series X, right? Like, yes, I got so yes. many good games, it's a real champagne problem. Not, oh no, I can't watch football. Like, that's just a first world problem. Like, yes, yes. Okay, fair. 
but the two game system things can be a first world problem. It can be a champagne problem, but a champagne problem is specifically when two good outcomes are there. Pre-ordering an Xbox and not getting it on release date is a first world problem. Having both and not being not knowing which one to play, that's a champagne problem. It's less okay. of a first world problem, I think, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. That makes sense. Anyway, any other news about the Fastiverse? I mean, what we talked about was not exactly uh, Fastiverse related, but uh, any no. news about the Fastiverse? No, that's that's all I got for now. Yeah, I don't think there's anything going on. Hopefully, after the... I don't know that we're going to get anything in December. We might. But, you know, once January rolls around, we'll be only a couple months out and with vaccines closer to whatever and people, you know, movie theaters wanting to get back in the swing of things and whatever. Maybe we'll get some trailers. Who knows? But, yeah, nothing going on right now in the world of the Fast and Furious true the last thing to do then in a very brief intro this might either be really interesting or not interesting at all because i think we went into these in pretty great detail this lap already but we are kicking off the extended run of the fast and furious minute with the deleted scenes and the first one up is brian and mia walk to her car so what are you studying for you want to be a nurse or something why do you say that well because you're so concerned about my personal hygiene yeah but if i was a guy you would just automatically assume that i was going to be a doctor right yeah, I'm basically just your average sexist grease monkey. Well, speaking of, it's my brother that wants me to be the doctor. He doesn't quite understand that I got to get into college first, get straight A's, and then apply to medical school. No, so. Mia, yeah, come on, already get on it. Well, at least he believes in you. Yeah, yeah, he's probably going to to death. He's on my ass 24 7. Why do you think it means so much to him? Maybe he wants me to put him back together for free when he crashes. In this minute, or in the scene, whatever you want to call it, it's after the party where the buster brought me back. Yep. Me and Brian walk to her car so that she can drive him home. Me and Brian talk about Mia's future and about Dom. This is kind of interesting. If you had a new, very attractive friend and your sister was about your age, even if they're friendly and they come home, you would let her take him home? Well, I feel like it might be in this situation, Dom is being subservient to Letty. That, come upstairs and, I, and give me a massage. And then Mia's like, ah, shit, the new guy's got to go home. I guess I'll drive him. Yeah, but also, like, he's cute be, and dreamy. Yeah, yes. And I guess you can't. You definitely can't have Vince drive him home, right? Because they almost got into a fist fight. So it's definitely not Vince. And like Leon's going to be with Vince. They took a taxi there the rest of the way. I think it's more like Mia being like, oh, my brother's not here. Do you need a ride home? Like, yeah. So we learn in this minute, as you just heard, there's a lot of dialogue. And this is the first. So I found a script online for the first movie that had all the dialogue. So I was basically yes. correcting it. This is me writing up the dialogue. And I was like, shit, there's a lot of talking in this one. And I remember I looked back at the notes from why Rob Cohen cut this. And he said it was too florid, like too florally written, like too wordy, too like putting things on the, like, too on the nose. But yeah. I, there's so much dialogue here, especially since like we've had a lot of scenes, especially toward the end where it was like the final hijacking and then the race where there's no dialogue for entire minutes. And then here in 46 seconds, there's so much dialogue. Yep. But we learn what Mia's studying, what she wants to be ostensibly a nurse or a doctor she wants to be a doctor she's giving brian a a nudge with the like oh did you think i was going to be a nurse because i'm a woman well does she say that she wants to be a doctor because she just she, she's it's going implied. to she wants to go to med school well because brian says you want to be a nurse she's like what because i'm a woman but like that doesn't mean that no it just means that don't be a sexist average grease monkey yeah but i think that she's also implying like hey women can be doctors too hint hint for our next movie but like i think she i think she's like she's gonna go to med school oh yeah for sure it's just you know she's studying biology or pre-med or something yes she's still doing biology so she's not like in med school so she that's that's a very good point like she's not committed to saying she's in med school yet or going to med school because she doesn't ultimately know yet also we could convince brian to talk about this on this podcast because she's a high school student is she Well, because she says, I got to get into college first, get straight A's, then apply to medical school. She's in high school. That makes this movie more problematic than I imagine. Well, Well, she she could be 18. 18. You're right. You're right. But that's still that's still weird. Well, Brian's probably I mean, he's got a job. He's like a he's a relative grown up, but he's probably we've we've looked this up before. Brian O'Connor. He's like 23. 1978. July 14th, 1978. So he's 23. Yeah, eh, not great. What's yeah, half three plus seven for the for the creepy guys in the crowd? So that would be like <laughs> 11 and a half, 18 and a half. It's, it's borderline. It's real close. Borderline acceptable in that like creepy math way. In the creepy math way for sure. But also like you have to remember like in real life, he is a cop. So he's like 
done the cop training. What makes it even creepier is that guy at work with him who's like, you know, I'd get off to her pictures too or whatever. Like, that's yeah, a he's like, like that's 40. a grown up, grown ass man, right? <laughs> that's so. a grown ass man. You're right. Yes, yes. But Mia jokingly or not seems frustrated at Dom in this minute for, for being a grease monkey. Like, speaking of grease monkeys, let's talk about, like, it might be also just kind of a throwaway joke, but it's also like, I get the impression that maybe, like, I kind of want my brother to do more with his life a little bit. Like, little do we know that in a couple of years, he'll be a multimillionaire thief, spy, whatever, right? But like running Food Shack and just being a grease monkey and like, it's a noble profession, but also it feels like Mia sees that there could be more within the eyes of Dominic Toretto. Also, maybe can we perceive this that she's maybe kind of covering for him because she knows what he's actually doing yeah and it's like it's like a it's like a tell she's like oh remember he's a he's a mechanic nothing more exactly right like it feels a little bit like that like what were you doing nothing i wasn't doing anything you know, yeah, like, oh. definitely not jacking trucks exactly and then we learn that mia fears something bad is coming for dom or that one day even if she doesn't fear that one day she might have to tend to him because whether it's the racing or just his combative nature or the thing she's not alluding to which we're talking about is going to get him in trouble he's gonna get banged up and she's gonna have to be there to take care of him so the med school stuff might have a double a dual purpose not only something noble that she's interested in but also her brother's about to get fucked up at some point i like the foreshadowing of that and i'm sad that that part got cut out like i like this whole scene you're right it's a little wordy but i'm also sad that it got cut out because it 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 plays nicely to the movie this is like you know we talk when we were like doing the other deleted scenes and stuff that like some of them feel like you're like okay they cut them for time or whatever but this one's just like it's just wordy if it would have gotten trimmed a little bit there's a lot of good stuff here yeah and we talked about last episode our hobbs and shaw episode about the impressions a character doing an impression of another one and here we get the famous mia doing an impression of dom Mia, come on already. Like, Get so. on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what'd you notice? What's here? What's here for you? The hard thing is, is that a lot of these aren't like remastered. So yes, very, colors and details are very difficult. They're very, very blurry. They're like, they're like if you ripped it off of TV when we had VCRs. I would use my digital copy of the first movie, but I don't know how to rip, I, whatever. Long story short, I'm using the YouTube rip for these. I think there's probably, may, no, no, there's like a, maybe there's a slightly better, but I think it's like a widescreen in a full, like it was not an ideal situation. Like there's no. not, a, there's not a crisp version of this that we could use. No, there's not like the nice, like remastered fucking 1080p versions of these. So it's hard to, to point out some of the stuff, but also this, these are short scenes. This one was just on the porch of the house so and in the dark so i didn't notice too much i got the cars you can see leon's yellow skyline in the background you can see mia's car because they obviously get into that and one of the only fun things that i did notice is that there's a window air conditioner in the house next to theirs and i was thinking like we have a lot of window air conditioners in new england yep because like a lot of houses yeah a lot of houses didn't have air conditioners but i'm like but in la like a house without air conditioning like central air that's kind of weird that was like the only thing that really struck me that you catch like as they're walking out you see the people de- dancing through the window so the party's still going on if we know that dom is with letty upstairs they're just having a party in their house with like no supervision of their house well that's a thing that we will get into in our next movie but that reminds me of like having a housekeeper letting multiple people into your house and being like hey i gotta go can you let them know the people are here it's like yes. wait what who are you you don't know you didn't ask who we are it just I, I feel like that's kind of you know like a home base of sorts for their friend True. group there might be strangers there but also could just be you know leon and vince and the girl that vince is trying to sleep with or what you know like you don't know jesse's still there yeah yeah because there's 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 a decent number of people there but it feels like they're all it's not a wild party and it feels like mostly people that will eventually know so it's it's definitely weird but it's not like insane i don't think but with no homeowner supervision there is so many lit candles in there, don't forget, that this is actually a fire hazard. This is like a dangerous situation. If somebody like Couldn't have said candle, it better myself. Absolutely. You might want to have a, one of the homeowners there, or at least check the batteries in your smoke detectors to make sure that nobody's going to catch on fire here. Thank you, Smokey Joe. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other notes about this scene? No, that was it. I will tell you that the next deleted scene we're going to do, and like, so we were talking about 
on mic a little bit, off mic a little bit about how to do these. As I was editing the scene down, like the the chunk on the YouTube, because we have the YouTube playlist of deleted scenes, one of those videos already off YouTube. I don't know which one it was. I'll figure that out, I guess, when we get to it. Who knows? The scenes are mostly under a minute. Some of them are a little bit longer. One's like significantly longer, but I think we're going to go scene by scene. So this one's 46 seconds, close to a minute. The next one we're doing is the one where they talk about OJ in the streets. It's like 15 seconds. So it's going to be a brief quote unquote minute next time but we're trying to i think extend the first movie because the first movie's fun and like we don't have to rush these we got nothing but time nah. so yeah we got so much time and like it will be nicer for my brain and yours i think if we have like first full movie like done 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 like yep. Yep. everything deleted scenes fucking everything just do it either way next lap we're gonna get to two anyway right so it's not like we're gonna get yeah. to two like even if we rush through it i don't think we get to two this lap anyway because we have the turbocharged prelude as well so exactly you know, we're gonna go through this at our deliberate pace and then do turbocharged prelude and then go down to miami for too fast amen exactly any other thoughts about anything or do you want to take a break and bring in nate to talk about spider-man 3 i think that we should take a break and i'm excited for you guys to hear the episode only because I mean, well, not only because, but mainly because Nate is just fucking an awesome dude and hilarious and cracks me It's up, a fun so. episode. It's a really it's good a really episode. It's a really fun episode. So let's take a break. Shout out once again to Jake Freer for sponsoring this. And we'll come back after this word from our sponsors. episode number 147, Spoderman 3. This episode's brought to you by Sand Isk Memory. In 1991, Sand Isk produced the first flash-based SSD in a 2.5 hard disk drive form factor for IBM with 20 megabyte capacity priced at about $1,000. So shout out to Sand Isk Memory. Shout out to Sandisk and welcome back to the show. Shout out once again to Jake Freer for sponsoring this episode, for being a patron on Too Fast, Too Forever.com and picking this movie for us to talk about. With us today to talk about this fine, fine film, we have a friend who has been, it's been too long since he has been on our podcast. We've gone on his, we're going to go back on his, spoiler, in January we'll be back. But we have with us once again, everyone's favorite wrestling correspondent, Mr. Nate Milton. Hello, Nate. Yo, Joes, what what is going on, my brothers? How have you been? It's been too long. Like, I, I think... The last time we spoke, it was a different world. It was, you know, not to get too political here, fellas, but it was before a big event in America. And, and let's yes. just say everything was kind of tense before that event. But the last couple of weeks, guys, I just felt more lighthearted. Like today, I went out and Good. took a stroll. I took a stroll around my block. I mean, I say it's a stroll, Joey, but it was more like a strut, right? Like I was <laughs> just Feeling myself and pointing at indiscriminate women who weren't interested in me. I bought a new outfit. And yes, I've, I've just been having the time of my life this last week or so. <laughs> Did you comb your hair over in a new way over one of your eyes to show the world that you're a different person now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that as one would do, as one does. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. And of course, you know, your girlfriend who is now uh, no longer a Broadway star, now just a singer waitress, but you know, things are looking up for you. (laughs) Hey, everybody's got, you know, everybody's got a part to play. We're always fighting with ourselves. Only when you can combine both sides of yourself, can you truly win the battle. That's what I've heard. For sure. <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility and great piano keyboarding. <laughs> so as a quick... Okay, so I had to... I have not seen any of these three movies in a long time. I've seen the, the Tom Holland ones. I've seen the Andrew Garfield ones. So I'm going to do a quick, quick plot summary of the first two. I, I recapped the wikis last night. I sent them to Joe because I was like, I just need to remember. As a precursor, if you're out there listening, you don't remember how things break down because Joe's like, is this the Green Goblin one? I was like... It I think they all kind of are, and they all kind of are. Okay, so the first one, Peter gets bitten by a super spider. Norman Osborn, a scientist and the owner of Oscorp, experiments on himself. Unstable chemical goes insane. Uncle Ben gets killed. Norman interrupts an experiment by a rival company, kills several people. Peter gets a job at the Daily Bugle. Norman, who's now the Green Goblin, kills his company's board after learning they plan to force him out. He fights and hurts Spider-Man, then recognizes Peter's wounds, attacks and hospitalizes Aunt May. 
Mary Jane becomes obsessed with Spider-Man, but is dating Harry, who's Norman's son, played by James Franco. Harry, in a jealous fit, tells his dad that Peter loves MJ, whom Norman then kidnaps. They fight. Spider-Man kills Norman. Before he dies, Norman tells Peter not to kill or not to tell Harry his true identity. <laughs> Harry swears vengeance against Spider-Man. MJ kisses Peter, who tells her they can only be friends as a way to protect her. So, whew. That was the first Spider-Man came out in 2002. $139 million budget, $825 million Jeez. worldwide. Jesus. Wild success. Jesus. 90% Rotten Tomatoes yep. by critics, 67% by the audience. It was like one of the first um, like Superman or superhero revival movies, right? Yeah. Around this time, it was this and the X-Men movies that came back and were like, oh no, like these can be a thing that people yep. want to see. That's yes. not like, because like for better or worse, like Marvel and DC kind of spent a lot of the later 90s making people never want to see a movie, like one of these movies again. Yep. To the yep. point where, like, I think in the X-Men movies when they were coming out, they were like, oh, like, this is going to be bad just because it was a comic book thing. So, <laughs> yeah, like, after Batman 89, from, like, Batman 89 to when we get Spider-Man, X-Men, and Blade to a certain extent, like, it was just this desert for comic movies just because nobody knew how to do them correctly. And the audience just kind of gave up, particularly after like Batman Forever and, and, yep. and yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like those kind of movies forever. just didn't really hit with the audience. And to the point where, like, we'll talk about in this one about what happened after this movie. But like, Batman and Robin was so poorly received mm. that like they scrapped multiple movies after that. Where like Nicolas Cage going to play Superman? They're going to have like a Batman versus Superman back then. Like. There was this whole plan. Yep. That movie bombed so hard. This movie, I'll get to the numbers later, but this movie did not do the way that people wanted it to, and they scrapped, like, three other movies after this. So, mm. like, total reshuffling of everything. So, okay. Spider-Man 2 comes out a couple years later. Two years later, Peter is estranged from both MJ and Harry. He's suffering temporary losses of his power. Harry, that now leads Oscorp's research division, sponsors a project by this guy, Otto Octavius. Mm -hmm. who wears a harness of powerful robotic tentacle arms powered by AI. Power spike causes the reactor to de destabilize, killing Octavius' wife. Doctors then try to remove the tentacle arms, but they become sentient, kill the doctors. Octavius ex uh, escapes, robs a bank to further his research. MJ gets engaged, sending Peter into a breakdown, loses his powers. He quits a superhero gig. Doc Ock demands an isotope from Harry, who offers it in exchange for Spider-Man. Doc Ock kidnaps MJ, bringing Peter's powers back. Ock and Spider-Man fight. Ock delivers Peter to Harry. Harry's shocked to learn that Peter is Spider-Man. Peter goes to save MJ. He battles Doc Ock, convinces him to let his dream go for the greater good. MJ learns who Spider-Man really is and runs off. Harry sees a vision from his father, seeking vengeance for his death. Harry then finds a secret room with Green Goblin's gear. MJ ditches her fiancé at the altar and runs off to be with Peter. Mm. So this one, a little bit of a bigger budget, $200 million, and made seven eighty eight. so a little bit more money. Made a little bit less, but wildly overall successful. 93% from the critics, 82% from the audience. This was this whole new thing that like they were going to, like, it was going to be Spider-Man 3, going to push it to bigger, better places. Even bigger budget, $258 million, Made the most money of the original trilogy of $894 million. And even though this movie is, like, kind of hated by a lot of people, mm. it's not wildly negative. 62% by critics, 51% by the audience. Mm. And I just, you know, I don't love Rotten Tomatoes, but those numbers are not as bad. Mid-range as I expected them to be, yeah. and it made more money than any other one, and, like, it just feels like the overall reception to this, mm -hmm. and, Nate, I'm gonna, you know, when I, when I sent you the list of the movies that we, we wanted to have you on, like, you, without without hesitating, you're like, oh, Spider-Man 3, I was like, okay, so I don't know if you have, like, a different <laughs> recollection of the, the 2000s, but, like, what do you remember about this? Did you see this in theaters? Did you remember, mm -hmm. like, the reaction, the reception, like, because this seems successful enough mm -hmm. to keep going but sam raimi was unhappy producers were unhappy they had like debates and arguments over the fourth script so like what do you remember from this time do you like this movie do you like these fr this franchise this trilogy it, what's what's going on with you and spider-man oh uh, see I, I love this franchise but this film is like the outlier it's the it's the black suited sheep of the family <laughs> if you will <laughs> I love it. And, and we'll talk about it when we get deeper into the movie, but it felt like the plan was just to do more of everything. For yeah, Spider-Man yes. 3, like bigger budget, we'll have more antagonists, we'll just do two musical numbers for no reason, yeah, and mm -hmm. like whatever, like there was nobody kind of telling either Raimi or the studio, like, hey, let's pump the brakes. And so the reason why I wanted to talk about this film is, A, like I'm a 
Homer for superhero films. But B, like I feel like this is a cautionary tale that a lot of studios have not listened to. I know you mentioned a potential Batman versus Superman movie earlier, and I feel like a young Zack Snyder somewhere probably should have watched Spider-Man 3 and maybe... <laughs> Maybe learned a lesson or two, not to disparage the brother's work, but maybe he could have learned something from watching Spider-Man 3. You know, this is a film, Joe, that everything should have worked. And like you said, it did make money. It's a movie that's so forgettable when you yeah. compare it to the first Spider-Man, which a lot of people still hold in high regard. And then Spider-Man 2, which I think you'd get a good number of people saying that's their favorite Spider-Man movie ever. Maybe even yep. their favorite comic movie. So when you come off of that hype and you come down to... Spider-Man 3, which just felt like an overstuffed film that didn't really have a direction. Uh, it's just disappointing. But, like, there are still moments in this movie. Like, I was watching it today just to refresh my memory because that is the theme of this lap. I got to refresh my memory. <laughs> of course, yep. you got it. You know it. Halfway through the film, I'm just sitting there like, you know what? I could easily turn this off and just pull up the Wikipedia page and bluff my way <laughs> through this episode. But I'm not going to do that to the Joes. I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to watch this whole thing to the finish. And and like by the time I got to the end, it's like there's maybe like 30 minutes out of this movie in, in terms of scenes that I really, really kind of love. Most of them with J.K. Simmons. But then there's just so much that's like, oh, you, you could have done so much better here. So, yeah, this is an interesting kind of entry into the Spider-Man filmography. And I definitely want to talk about the overstuffed nature of this in a little bit, because I think this is the first and maybe only Spider-Man movie that has more than one villain, and it feels like they don't yeah. know how to do that. But Joe, mm. what about you? What's your relationship with these Spider-Man movies, and how do you feel about this one? I definitely saw the first one in theaters, and I think I probably saw it with my uncle in theaters, because I remember we were going to see like Harry Potter's and some of the superhero movies as they came out, and this feels like around that time. And I remember really loving the first one. And we watched it a ton and we even watched it as kids like on DVD or, you know, like however we had it, maybe VHS back in the day. And then I remember too, but when I was like, when we were talking last night and you were giving me the recaps, I was yep. like, I don't remember what three is at all. I just a blank slate in my head, right? And then when I was watching it with Rachel today, I was like, I feel like I've seen this one in theaters at some point because it kind of feels familiar but I also don't remember it. And she's like, well, it's very forgettable. And I was like, yep, hmm. that pretty much sums it up. I don't mind it. I, I definitely feel like you you guys are right. I, I felt like there was a lot going on. There's just like a lot of chaos. The two villain thing gets me. Because it's like, you know, you should just pick one. Otherwise, mm -hmm. this feels like two movies that you're kind of smushing together. Like, I have a question for you guys. Because Rachel always brings up that she hates Tobey Maguire and Spider-Man. She like, wasn't a big fan of the Tobey Maguire Spider-Mans. And then we have Andrew Garfield. And we have now Tom Holland. Mm -hmm. Yep. We started, Joey and I started with Zack Attack, right? And it reminds me of that scene from Neighbors. He's like, you know, who's your Batman? Sure. Who is your Spider-Man, guys, Ooh. both of you? Mm. To me, this is easy. Like, I know I made the pensive thinking sound, like, hmm. But it's it's really not that hard because I feel like Tobey Maguire, to me, up until Tom Holland, was a better Peter Parker than Spider-Man. And then I felt okay. like Andrew Garfield was a better Spider-Man than Peter Parker. Okay. Because I'm not here for your little, like, pretty boy. Like, pretty boy Pete ain't, that ain't Peter Parker. <laughs> no, nope, it's not. This is what I tell Rachel all the time. I agree, yes. Uh, but Tom Holland is, like, the best of both. Not only is he age-appropriate, which neither of the other two were, uh, but he's, like, the perfect kind of geeky, awkward, but not too awkward Peter Parker. And then... He's like this really cool, inquisitive Spider-Man. So yeah, Tom Holland's the guy. I came to these late. I don't think I saw any of these three in theaters. I, th I think I saw them all on DVD after the fact. I saw both Andrew Garfield in theaters. The f we're not talking about those today, but the first one, The Amazing Spider-Man, Yes. I think 80% of that is a great movie, and then just 20% of it is just like, this is not good. And then the second one is kind of hot trash, like worse <laughs> than this, I think. Like That is probably <laughs> the worst Spider-Man movie. Like, that is just bad. But then to Nate's point, like Tom Holland comes around, you're like, oh, not only... Does the MCU bring him in in a new way that we don't have to have an origin story, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we don't have to see him become Spider-Man. He just shows up fully formed in Civil War. He's part of the Tony Stark world, and just, like, it's great from the jump. I also do want to give a shout-out to my special, my main man, uh, Nicolas Cage, just Spider-Man Noir. If I have to pick one, mm -hmm. Spider-Man Noir is probably up Ooh. there. And yeah. just Miles Morales and all of it. Like, that's the best. In the Spider-Verse is the yeah, best Spider-Man. Like, that's just unbelievably good. But yeah, of the three... 
And there were rumors that they wanted to get all three of them back in Spider-Verse. They might be in the sequel or whatever, just have like a multiverse of just like uh, all the different like Spider-Men mm-hmm. we knew. Yeah, Tom Holland is great. And I, I like Nate's breakdown of the who's the better Peter Parker versus a better... Like, I, yes, I like Tobey Maguire as a Peter Parker, even though I'm not a big fan of Tobey Maguire. Like, shout out to Mr. Third Times, Mike Manzi. When we did the Charlie Theron podcast, he was in Cider House Rules, which mm. we both hated. And uh, he's just like a obsequious suck-up in that. Like, it was just it, bad. And like, Mike hates Tobey Maguire. And so, uh, shout out to him for the third time to charm, but also just the anti Tobey Maguire sentiment. But I think, <laughs> as a Peter Parker date, I think you're right. Like, I think he's great in this, but then the Spider-Man himself in this is kind of, I, I, okay, sure, whatever. Like, especially if you go back to, uh, and I know we're not talking about Spider-Man 2, but, like, the Peter Parker in Spider-Man 2 is just comic accurate. Like, this guy that can't catch a break, he's in this crappy apartment, he's trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, like... <laughs> Yeah, you would think Spider-Man could afford a better apartment, right? <laughs> if everybody knew he was Spider-Man, then yeah, maybe. But not if he's just like, you know, a photographer that doesn't have a steady job at the Daily Bugle. I was like, let's be real. Like, the Daily Bugle is not some bastion of uh, employee fairness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. For Jonah's sure. probably maybe. paying him like, a, yeah, like five bucks a picture. <laughs> I think I think that you're right, and this is the argument that I get down to with Rachel all the time. That I think, but Nate said it way better. That I think Tobey Maguire is a great Peter Parker. So for me, I'm like he really hits it, and I love Tom Holland in general. But I think he's like a little too cute to be Peter Parker sometimes. Mm. But he's just so perfect, like as an actor and like in the universe, that it's great. Tobey Maguire is like top tier Peter Parker for me. You nailed it. That's that's what I think it is. I will say that the Gwen Stacy I prefer is Emma Stone. I'm so sorry that I don't. Want, I know you don't want to hear oh. that joe but i like gwen stacy i like the emma stone mm-hmm. a lot better than the brace dallas howard in this one i like mm-hmm. the zendaya mj much more yes. than the kirsten dunce even though kirsten yes. dunce is good yes. the zendaya is just you know next level but yeah like there's there's good parts i think to all three of them mm-hmm. i think in retrospect you'd be like okay i don't really have to watch spider-man 3 if i don't want to i don't have to watch the amazing spider-man 2 i can just kind of pick and choose my spider-man moments and like they're all they all have good things in them and i you know i love the J. Jonah jameson connection throughout all of them now so that's pretty cool with your man toby mcguire like I think one of the things that hurts the first three Spider-Man, uh, and, and I do still love one and two a lot, but I never bought the chemistry between Peter and MJ. Like I, I, I think I bought the I bought the Harry MJ chemistry more than Peter, and that that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. But also to that point, like Harry can cook. I mean, kind of cook. He's good looking. He's wealthy. He's mm-hmm. got good taste in music. You know, he's considerate. Like everything, it seems like Harry is like like compared to Peter. Like Peter's like kind of sweet, but it's like. Harry seems like a catch. Why wouldn't you? Like, get, yeah. get, get you a man that can do both, and that's Harry Osborne. Yeah, Harry's who I want to be married to. See, <laughs> seriously. Like. So before we dive into the discussion of the movie, here's some background trivia. So there was, this is very Fast and Furious of it. It was at one point considered to split this into two films. So mm-hmm. maybe there's the Sandman thing mm-hmm. and the Goblin Jr. thing. or what, like it, There were some kind, but they all decided to cram it into one. When it came out, Sam Raimi, the director, was deeply unhappy with how it turned out. He had hoped that the planned fourth film would have made up for it, and they had movies five and six planned too, but they never saw the light of day. Mm, mm, mm. Also very Fast and Furious, Bryce Dallas Howard, the aforementioned Gwen Stacy, was pregnant while filming this movie and mm. did all of her own stunt acting, which seems crazy because she was too much pregnant, but she didn't know at the time. Oh. Um, so she was doing all the stuff, but you know, we talk a lot about how Elena, the character now, you know, pregnant throughout the entire like Rio scene, like we're trying to, knowing when she's pregnant with baby Brian and like mm. what she's doing on screen and like it's kind of a Fast Nexion-ish there. Yep. James Franco, Joe, your boy James Franco I said that they James had to Franco. go back and reshoot part of the movie because audiences felt that they there wasn't enough action in this, which is, I think, a fair point because there's long stretches where it's like, yeah, like this is just about Peter more than Spider-Man. Like, this, <laughs> yeah. is, this is about him coming to terms with whether or not he can be in a relationship and paying rent essentially and getting a job and like supporting his girlfriend like which is why the the movie i think took two years and 10 months to make which is bananas like that is so long including six months just to make i mean doing other stuff at the same time but the final shot of the sandman forming took six months to create so that's just Mm. absurd amount of time there there's apparently an editor's cut of this movie that came out, Nate. I don't know if you know about this, but there's apparently a Spider-Man 2.1, and there's maybe, I don't know if they call this Spider-Man 3.1, but the editors recut it and like added some stuff, and now there's this, like, this petition online to release this officially, but it seems like people who love this movie have wanted to re-add some stuff that was on the chopping room, the cutting room floor, mm-hmm. and make it a more 
comprehensive, cohesive thing. Nate, do you think, I guess the big question is, do you think there's a great movie in here? That's interesting because I like when I was looking for the version I was going to watch, like there was, I think I saw a director's cut. I saw the regular version. And then, like you said, I saw people talking about it in editor's cut, but I couldn't, like, I, I didn't know if it was a real thing or not. So they're like, no, that, that, that's the answer. No. <laughs> It's not a good movie in here. I think there are good elements in here that you could transport to a different movie with a tighter script okay. uh, that would be better. Venom, like you can set up Eddie Brock, but we don't need to see Venom until like the very end of the movie leading into whatever the next Spider-Man would be. Agreed. Like, I think yep. having Venom in here just clutters things up a bit. It should be focused on Peter and Harry, and then Sandman can be our big villain. So yeah, I think there were, there were there's a way that you could kind of take p- bits and pieces from this film, leave the musical numbers, and then just, because <laughs> again, like, I'm not averse to musicals, like Hamilton might be my favorite movie of 2020. In the middle of Hamilton, we didn't get a fight between the Green Goblin and Spider-Man. <laughs> so in the, middle of, in the middle of Spider-Man, why are you giving me two fully fleshed out musical scenes, Sam Raimi? Uh, yeah. and, and, and we'll talk about it when we get to it, because I, I got like at least 10 more minutes of vitriol about these <laughs> musical scenes, fellas. Uh, but yes, yeah, to, to answer your question, I do think there were some good elements in this film because you're basically taking a lot of the same stuff that made the first two Spider-Man movies really good. So it's like you can work with some of this stuff, but he needed like Sam Raimi really needed somebody to kind of trim the fat on this thing. You know, in screenwriting, there's like the 110 page, like the Blake Snyder Save the Cat, which has pros and cons. And people say it's like reductive or whatever. But like, theoretically, the break into two should be like the big thing happens. And I feel like if Venom is going to be in your movie, Peter, maybe if if, if this is the route you want to take, Peter has to get infected by the symbiote like 25 minutes in, mm. not like 70 minutes in or whatever. Yeah. Like, why does that happen in the entire back half of this? Like mm. everything... There's good stuff here structurally, but to your point, Nate, like, if you're going to have Venom and Joe, I like your idea of, like, just having at the end, like, do it either early or just tease it at the end, because it feels like that's one element too many, the Topher Grace thing is one element too many, it's overstuffed, and, like, there's good stuff. Stuff, but I don't know that they know what to focus on. That's another thing that threw me off in this movie, fellas. Just remembering that, like, this was Topher Grace season. The time in, in our collective history where, like, Topher Grace was so hot coming off of that 70s show that we just cast him as Eddie Brock in a role that, and I, and I like Topher Grace. Like, I think Topher Grace is a good actor. But this was not a good fit for him as Eddie Brock, I don't think. Nah, and he apparently so. left that show to do this movie. Mm. Oh well, I mean, you gotta break in, man. Get get the bag. That's fine. <laughs> I have no problems with that. Like he knows that like you're gonna get paid on Spider Man. That's yeah. cool. But like also, this isn't the right character for you. He's a much better David Duke in Black Klansman than yes. Eddie Brock in Spider Man Three. <laughs> he is he is so good in Black Klansman. It's unbelievable. Oh man. My last little bit of trivia, and I want to move on to just to talk about the movie is. In consideration for the role of Gwen Stacy, we had Alicia Cuthbert, the titular girl next door, whom I Ooh. love, but I don't know. I, was, oh. I think she would have been good, but I don't know if she would have been great. But also in the running, Scarlett Johansson, who would obviously come oh, around to the movies before too long. So, Damn. But Joe, hit us with it. What are some thoughts? If you want to do some fast connections, overall reactions, takeaways, yes. hit us with some ideas. The first one off the jump, when we go on Rocky Maivia Picture Show with Nate, he likes to talk about music a lot. Sure. I think that for them to have the giant villain be the Sandman and not use Darud Sandstorm in this film oh. is so egregious <laughs> that I couldn't take it. Like, every time he would come up, I'd just be like, dun 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 Like, that's all I wanted. Just give me, like, one beat of it so mm-hmm. that, like, that's... Like, you had the money for it. You spent $250 million on this movie. Just give me that once. I thought you were going in a different direction, so I'm going to spoil too. a very <laughs> minor moment. Uh, so there's the there's the uh, monster feature, Crawl, that came out a couple years ago, which is about, like, killer alligators. Like, there's a hurricane. Yes, I remember and this. This is town, And it's great. And when the credits start, and I'm going to sort of spoil a minor thing, so if you don't want to just skip ahead, they play this, like old-timey, like, see-you-later alligator song. And I'm like, this is the perfect little button because, like, it doesn't fit the yes. movie at all, and it's wonderful. So I want Mr. Sandman, give me your dreams. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Like, that's where I thought. Like, that's what I want in the credits. Like, just, like, as a as a joke or something. Like, yes. Sandstorm makes sense, but, like, that that's right on the table for you, too. Oh, You're right see, there, brother. I thought you were going inner Sandman, like Mariano Rivera Ooh, coming oh, out of the bullpen. So good. <laughs> 
Yeah. Also perfect. Yeah, see, like, they flubbed so hard. We had three great options, and we weren't involved in this movie at all. And you don't <laughs> use either of these? That actually would have made Thomas Hayden Church more intimidating if you got Metallica pumping in <laughs> behind him. <laughs> like, it should just be, like, on a car radio, right? Like, like one of the people that was, like, you know, gets, like, mm. stuck in a traffic jam is just playing Enter the Sandman. Like on their radio, and then like the car flips or something. Like, come on. And maybe it's even James Hetfield in the car. Like, just throw a Metallica cameo oh. in there. And be like, hey. <laughs> oh. Yes. Oh. You just blew my mind. That was great. We fixed it, guys. We fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> the whole movie is done. Pack that up. We're good. That that's the editor's cut right there. It's just add eight <laughs> seconds of a cameo. You're done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this lap, we're focusing on memory yep. and Letty and Michelle Rodriguez. Is Mary Jane the most anti Letty character Ooh. we've ever seen in a movie so far that we've covered? <sighs> she's got an independent streak in her, but yes. I think she's she's also willing to just kind of roll over and take it, which is yes. I mean, just like you know, she gets fired and she doesn't even put up a fight and no. Nope. I mean, you, you know, she stands up for herself and like doesn't want to just give in to Peter, but it's it's hit or miss. Like sometimes she's Letty and sometimes she's, for lack of a better word, Mia. You're right. Yeah, I was I was seeing so little Letty in her, but I get the whole point of standing up to Peter, but he's not like an imposing force, right? Like he's kind of a pushover too. So standing up to Peter, what does that really mean? But I was just like, man, like, because, you know, now we have the Zendaya Mary Jane. So to see her play Mary Jane and be like actually like a strong woman, yes. it makes this one look even worse. Like it's so damsel in distress. I'm so helpless please come save me. That's what makes it like so hard for me to see. Also, she gets cucked really hard in yeah. public when like mm. they're celebrating Gwen Stacy's life and Peter's like, yeah, kiss me. You know, they'll love it. And like, he knows yeah. that MJ is in the crowd. Like, yeah, he went from talking to MJ to like getting changed and then dropping down to kick. Like, what are you doing, my man? I know. Bad move, bro. And I think the fact that like the fact that this was made in, like, it came out in 07, so you said it took two years, so let's go back to 05. Even if we go back to 04, guys, that's still three years after Beyonce blessed us with Independent Woman Part 1. Yep. Yes. And so it's like, yeah, like, it, it femi- like being a strong woman, I guess you could say feminism kind of, sort of, but that's charged in different ways. Having a strong female protagonist is not this weird idea. And so, yeah, like, there are moments where Mary Jane feels like she has agency. But then so often, like the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes of this movie, she's just hanging up somewhere waiting for Spider-Man to save her. And she's done that in the last, I think maybe all three movies, there's a point where Mary Jane is the damsel in distress. At this point, the city of New York has to kick Mary Jane out of the city because she's (laughs) wasting so much taxpayer money all the time. There's so much that they're like effort, like Mm. SWAT teams and tanks. Like she's every dollar of taxes has to go to save Mary Jane. Like once, once every couple years. They're like, look, girl, you, you, we love you, but you got to go to Jersey. Like we can't keep doing (laughs) this. We can't can't afford it anymore. Like, geez. (laughs) I I do want to, you know, I want to give a shout out to Thomas Hayden church because I do love him. Um, I don't know if either of you watched the show divorce on HBO. I don't know if it's still on. I don't know if it got COVID or what, but, uh, it's about he he's married to Sarah Jessica Parker. They get a divorce, and it's just about the fallout of that. And he is so goddamn wonderful on that show. And he just like there's a little bit like there's the emotional stuff at the end here. Mm-hmm. You know when he's able finally to sort of like a ghost kind of pass on, right? And mm-hmm. I like that stuff, but it feels like he's so underutilized. And maybe that's just the fact of the script being overstuffed. But mm-hmm. I just feel like there's a, a missed opportunity there. And also, why are you doing experiments out in the desert, like in an open pit? Like I know it's in a fence, but like that just seems <laughs> reckless. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of sciencey problems with this in the sense that like if Peter Parker is such a scientist, like he's like, you know, still studying science. He was hanging out with Dr. Ock. He like rips the venomness, the like the venom symbiote out of him in just like a church. Like, buddy, like, wh- why wouldn't you do this in a box that we could contain this afterward? <laughs> like, this is just bad lab practice. Like, you're just uh, causing chaos everywhere. Yeah, and, like, I, I get it. Like, it's a movie based on a script, which, like, there are going to be acts of convenience built into it. That's, that's how storytelling works. Like, there was just too much of that in this film. Uh, like, down to the fact where Thomas Hayden Church was the accomplice to the guy that killed Uncle Ben. That was a bit that, yes, Thomas Hayden Church was good in that scene where he was telling the story, but 
it did. It felt like something that either needed to be told earlier or not at all. Uh, yep. You know, not just let's let's wait till the last thirty minutes. Like when we get Peter Parker, you know, I I forgive you. Like I get that's supposed to be this big dramatic moment, Joe, but it doesn't feel earned. And it's not because Thomas Hayden Church isn't a good actor. It's because the script just feels so rushed and and kind of convenient. Where let's just wrap this up in a bow. Whereas if Sandman was our only villain, I feel like we could have hung out with him for a bit longer and actually gotten that empathy and the connection with him and his daughter and all that stuff. But they had so many story plots to, to service, whether you're talking about the Harry plot or the Venom plot, the relationship drama or the damn musical numbers that <laughs> Sandman was given like such a short shrift in terms of what he actually deserved in the script. Now, a question for you, Nate. If we take Venom out, like if we're trying to simplify this movie, we take Venom out entirely, we take out the Eddie Brock character entirely, do we leave Harry and Goblin Jr. in there, or do we take him out too? I leave him in there just because we, like, this story needs to be done. Like, we've been dragging this story out over three films, and this this is another one of my pet peeves with this film. Because, you know, a lot, a lot of people are like, oh, there's too many villains in here. You've got three villains if you count Harry. And, and I'm like, no, you have four villains. Because we got Venom, we got Sandman, we got Harry, and we got the damn butler. <laughs> the sir, butler? <laughs> sir, you like this worthless, trash, no good, great value Alfred. You could have <laughs> saved us two whole movies worth of drama if you had told this boy what happened to his father. But you want to wait until the very end of this movie you're like, sir... Spider-Man didn't kill your father. I was there that night. Like you could have, you could have told us this at the end of Spider-Man One, sir. Like how dare you? <laughs> Apparently, and I don't have the full context of this, but there was a trivia thing on IMDb about how there was an additional kind of storyline with the Butler and about how he was trying to like idealize or idolize or something like he was trying to like use Harry's like positive like because Harry goes off his cliff right and like becomes like obsessed with vengeance and whatever but apparently in spider-man 3 when harry loses his memory shout out to the memory mm. loss lap yes there's something with the butler where like he's like he, he wants to keep that innocence alive and so he actively chooses not to tell harry the truth but then like only does with 20 minutes left but you're right like he does that early or they keep this stuff in yeah. like it clears up a plot hole but otherwise it's just like why are you what are you doing <laughs> Yeah. The, the way he just comes out of nowhere, just like, oh, by the way, sir, I know you just had an argument with that spider fellow, but uh, he didn't kill your father, and I've got receipts. Like, you you could have done <laughs> this at any point over the last five years, sir. I, I do think, though, that they should have kept the Harry stuff in just because, like, that's a thread whether he dies or whether he lives. Because I, I would also have Harry live at the end of the movie. I think that's something that needed to be wrapped up in part three. And plus, you just get to keep Franco. Like, you need... Yeah, and Franco's good. Like, yeah, as an actor and, like, part of the movie, like, I get that they're dragging out because it's like, oh, we got James Franco and he worked really well, so, like, let's just keep going with this. You know, speaking of Harry, Joe, he says a line in here that is, like, so friendly. I mean, aside from the fact that you just love James Franco, but he says... It's a funny feeling not knowing who you are. I get a bump on the head and I'm as free as a bird. And he's like, oh, he got, he got bonked. And he now got he's bonked. Just... And then MJ's like, I wish I could do that. And he's like, bonk, and hits her on the head, like taps her on the head. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well played. And I'm getting this like lifetime -y vibe with the head bonks here. And then we're like at the end where MJ's hanging and she throws the cinder block and hits Venom <laughs> in the back of the head. And I was like, he got bonked too. There's like a lot of head bonks in this movie that I wasn't remembering. It's like an episode of the Flintstones, like where Fred keeps getting hit on the head and he <laughs> turns into a different character. Now he's yeah. Federico Flintstone, world famous driver. <laughs> <laughs> So because we have the head bonks, I was thinking of, of Lifetime movies, and I think this mm. is the perfect time to bring up that like a common recurrent theme, Nate, I don't know if you know this or not, but in Lifetime movies, there's a lot of musical numbers, mm. and I always make the argument that this is how they sell the actress into you know being in the Lifetime movie, like, hey, we'll give you a musical number, and then if you become a singer, you know, like you can showcase your your voice in this film. In this, I was like, is that what they were doing to Kirsten Dunst here? Like, was she like eventually trying to become a singer, and that's why they gave her two musical numbers? Because two is super excessive. One is one is even like it doesn't really fit, but I get it. But like two, why did we have two here? I don't know if you guys remember the Justice League animated series. Like, for my money, is still the greatest implementation of uh, comic characters in the medium. Like, that 
that series. And there's an episode where Kevin Conroy voices Batman. And out of nowhere, he just does this musical number. And it's like you can tell Kevin Conroy loves to sing, like he's a crooner in his, yeah. in his spare time. And this was the finally the opportunity that they could work it into the show. And yes, so this feels just like that. My problem, and since we're here, let's let's go ahead and yep. talk about it, fellas. Toby Maguire, like okay, so I know there's a cliche about the rhythmic styling, shall we say, of our white brothers and sisters. <laughs> And, and, it's, and it's a trope because you know, like I know a lot of white people that can dance really well. Justin Timberlake, you know, yeah. all the guys in NSYNC, the Backstreet Boys. There's a lot of good white dancers out here, ladies and gentlemen. Toby Maguire is not one of them. <laughs> Toby Maguire might have the the least amount of rhythm I've ever seen. <laughs> like, and I, I don't know. Like, I don't know who told him he could do this, Joey. Like, I don't know who told Toby Maguire, like, go down the street and strut, and you're gonna look great because like, even. <laughs> Like, you can tell. He's in his head. He's like, and one, and two, and one, and two. <laughs> even, even keeping time, he's off beat. This is not a good look. Like, whoever decides, like, it's it's funny, but it's not funny in the way I think Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire intended it to be. So I think what's funny, and I think this is, again, I don't know if it's meant to be funny or not, but they describe the symbiote, the scientist is like, it seems to amplify or enhance the personality of the of the host yes. and it also tends toward aggression and so he becomes kind of aggressive and kind of dickish and bossy and manipulative yeah. but also feels like he just enhances his honkiness or his like <laughs> his inability to walk because when he's walking down the street he's like the object of sex appeal to like half the women and then the other half of the women are like what are you doing like <laughs> It's taking his dorkiness and being like, oh, no, that's to 11 now, in, a, in addition to his emo-ness and his aggression. So, like, in a way, again, don't know if it's intentional or not, but it takes the fact that he's just, like, this dorky, uncoordinated white boy who was bitten by a spider and became a superhero, but takes all of that, like... <laughs> human nature of his mm. and enhances it in a way that it's like oh no like he was never gonna like it does like the symbiote doesn't make him cool it just <laughs> enhances what's already there and what was already there was really embarrassing mm. I, are you trying to give him an out are you just, are you saying he's a good actor for playing up his whiteness i don't know or, I, I think or it's, i think it's one reading possibly i, I do like that reading though because yeah, at least it, it fits with the mythology of the world but yeah like the moment even when he buys the new the new suit and, and he's supposedly cool and he comes out and he does that little rowboat number or whatever the hell you call it, it's like even then he doesn't look cool. It's like, oh, oh, Toby. Like I'm not white, I'm not white, Toby, and I was embarrassed for my white brothers and sisters on your behalf. I love it's it. It's bad. It's bad. Because I feel like we're focusing on the, the sidewalk number, but let's let us not forget, let us not gloss over the number in the club. The the of course. The, the, yeah. Like, get better to dig on this. Like, <laughs> let's not forget the pelvic thrusts and the, like the, the the Bob Fosse-esque choreography that we've got here in this motion picture, guys. I really like, it, it should be called Spider-Man 3 colon all that jazz. <laughs> here you go. Showtime. <laughs> You know, one thing to pivot off this, because I feel like this is a rabbit hole we may never recover from. <laughs> one thing I genuinely do love about this movie, and I totally forgot was in this, but Elizabeth Banks as Betty Brant yes. is like mm -hmm. an absolute amazing element of this. Like, I don't know how far, and I want to look it up. I didn't, I meant to. I know that she was in, you know, Wet Hot earlier, so she was like already a thing. I know that, but like, she is so goddamn good, both on her own and with Toby, and also with... J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons, yeah. yeah. Like, all yeah. of every... No matter who she's with, it's like, oh, she pops. The black hair, kind of working for me, kind of weird, but looks aside, I think just, it's amazing how funny and just... I want to spend time in the Daily Bugle. Like, I don't care about all the mm. everything else, but, like, J.K. Simmons trying to keep his stress under control yes. and her trying to yep. keep him in line and also just you know be an independent woman in the city like she's amazing like i want to spend more time there yeah we have um brian he does his awards on high school summer party yep this definitely felt like the character that i want more of in this film and it, i don't think mm -hmm. it really works especially you know because we have so much going on but like you're a thousand percent right every time she was on the screen i was like just glued like this is awesome she's killing it why isn't she way more prominent in this movie it took me a while to remember that banks was actually in this movie because at first i'm like 
is that Parker Posey? And I love Parker Posey. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Like, you can throw Parker Posey in anything, even Blade Trinity, and it makes that thing more watchable just for her being in it. So at first, I, like, for about two, three minutes, I'm like, oh, Parker's in this movie. And then I had to Wikipedia, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's Banks. I'm like, okay, that's cool. But yes, J.K., uh, Banks, Bill Nunn playing uh, Robbie Robertson. I wish we could have stayed in the, at, at the Bugle more. Eddie Brock aside, because uh, I thought Eddie was just like, let's not bring Topher into this. Let's let's <laughs> keep that separated. But like the relationship between Peter and and Betty, and then Peter and Robbie, who's kind of like the, they've got like almost this uncle nephew relationship, uh, and then Jonah Jameson, who is like the abusive father. Like I love just kind of the dynamics at the paper. Uh, so maybe that's what I really want from this film, Joe. Is much less a superhero action film. And more like a day to day newspaper drama. Like, yeah. this, this was 90 minutes of Daily Bugle. I'm, I'm here for it. The images that they have, whether they're the doctored Photoshop ones or not, like what they turn in are like these spectacular action shots. Yes. But it seems like every time either Eddie Brock or Peter Parker is on the scene, all of their pics are just like medium close ups of a person. It's just like, <laughs> hey, so like Spider Man saves. Gwen Stacy from a building, and then they land on the ground, and he's like, oh, let me take a picture, and she leaves. It's like, no, like, have the two of you together. Like, you have the worst eye for photojournalism I've ever seen. Like, you can't be together. Like, have some kind of, like, dynamic, like, in front of the building, but, like, no, he's just, like, standing there not posing alone in front of nothing. It's like, what are you doing? How are you... How is this your job? Yeah. I was gonna say, at once, like, the bugle feels like the biggest paper in New York City, and also the most bootleg, rinky-dink run organization in the entire town. Like it, I love it. It's at once like the mecca of journalism and also the National Enquirer at the same time. And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm here for the Daily View. You would think that if they didn't unknowingly have Spider-Man on staff <laughs> and like <laughs> ostensibly be the only paper in town, like it feels like Spider-Man photos yes. are keeping that paper afloat. Yep. Like yes. without that, without Peter like setting up selfie timers or whatever <laughs> and swinging by, like without that, they have nothing. Yeah, because they're not reporting on the Mets or the Yankees or the Giants. <laughs> they're not reporting on politics. It's like wall-to-wall coverage of Spider-Man. That's You're right. That's the that's what's keeping the economy going at the Bugle. Bring me more Spider-Man pictures. <laughs> there was a couple fast connections in this movie, much mm. more so than we've been getting, like, that we've, we've had, right? It starts with when Peter Parker's listening to the scanner, and I felt very reminiscent of, like, the streets closed pizza boy type situation. Oh, okay. And, like, even the codes were kind of, it like, the voice, the codes, everything kind of sounded similar. So I was, like, feeling that relation there. In our lap, we've been saying, like, whoever has the amnesia, do they become, so, like, is Harry Letty, right? Like, and yes. not really, but kind of. But I'm thinking, okay, if Harry is Letty, mm -hmm. and Peter goes evil... It's like Dominic Toretto just went rogue. So, like, Peter is kind of Dom. Does that mean that, like, is that the true love story? It's like the Dom and Letty, but it's like the, the Harry and Peter. But also, it should be, like, the true love story of Fast and Furious is Dom and Brian. So, like, the pieces are all there. But like much of the rest of this movie, it's all kind of askew and doesn't line up the way that it should. But, like, archetypally, the pieces are there. But, like, I don't know who MJ is. I don't know who mm -hmm. other, like, I don't know who Eddie Brock is. But it feels like there's some kind of love story between Harry Harry and Peter, that's kind of reminiscent of Dom and Letty or Dom and Brian or something, but I don't know. We often talk about like Dom and Elena and Letty as a love triangle, but we never get this version of a love triangle mm -hmm. in the Fast and Furious where it's like two scorned lovers at the same time. Like when we have the scene with like, you know, Peter Parker and MJ there and then making out with Gwen Stacy at the same time. Because like Elena and Letty kind of, they don't overlap ever. Or, like, at least not, like, not known by them, you know, because Letty's forgotten right. and, and she comes back. And then, like, when she comes back, Elena kind of goes to the side. We don't have, like, this tension where there's, like, a love triangle that's happening mm -hmm. in real time at the No, same and that's, time. like, your whole thing, right? Because you're, like, when Letty shows up, everything else gets to put on the back burner, right? Like, MJ's in the yeah. crowd. It should be, like, nobody else matters. But it's, like... Hey, mm -hmm. Letty's here, but also Elena's here, and I'm gonna make out the late. It's like, no, that doesn't like no. that goes that flies in the face of what you've been like your theory ish that you've been having, you know, for for laps now. It just felt weird that like whenever we say love triangle, this is what I'm usually thinking of, but in mm -hmm. the Fast and Furious context, it's something completely different. And I, I think you are right though that the real romance or the real relationship here is between Peter and Harry. Because there's yeah. so much more chemistry between Maguire and Franco than Maguire and Dunst. 
like even the the bit where Harry comes back at the end to to help fight the villains with Spider Man, and and they had like the the witty banter back and forth, quote unquote. Like, what took you so long? <laughs> hey, you know how it is, Pete. And it's like, you know what? I hate the words that they're putting in your mouth, but <laughs> like you can tell, like there's a genuine affection between these two these two guys. And so, yeah, like I I oh, and I know they would never make a Spider Man movie without Mary Jane or you know MJ in the new. MCU Spider-Man movies. I almost wish we just had more of Peter and Harry because I believe that relationship a lot more than I do with Harry and MJ or even Peter and MJ. That and the the we always pitch the love story between Brian and Dom fits so well, and mm. they do have like amazing chemistry. But also, like it's it's your buddy, and if like story wise, if you knew this guy since you were young kids and your friends, like. That is going to be like a really close relationship. Whether or not we like make it weird and romantic or not is our choice. But it, you're going to have a stronger relationship than you and your even you know girlfriend, right? Like that's just like br- like they're bros that like grew up together. So and the only one that could break up that relationship was some trifling butler. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, do you have any other notes or thoughts about the movie or any other rants about the music scenes that you want to uh, get off your chest before we play a couple games? A couple things. Number one, I think to sum up my feelings about this movie, there's a reporter in this film that gets a pretty decent amount of screen time during the action scenes for whatever reason. And she she sums up the film for me. When they're, when uh, I believe it's when Spider-Man is getting beat down. Like Venom's got Peter tied down and Sandman are just wailing on him. And the reporter looks at the camera and she's like, it's hard to believe what's happening. The brutality of it. I don't know if we can take this anymore. And that's that's how I felt at this moment in the movie, guys. I was like, it's hard to know what's going on. Just the brutality of this film. Like, If, it, if not for my, my affection for the Joes, I would have turned this off 45 minutes ago. <laughs> this is what happens, not to get too poetic, but I feel like Sam Raimi, like this was his Icarus film. Like he had two great films, and in this one, he got a little too close to the sun. And his wings yeah. started to melt a little bit, and he crashed and burned. Because I think there is a good film if you make this two movies. If we've got a Sandman movie that deals with that story, and we wrap up the Harry Peter conflict, and then we come back with a big Venom movie. Because Venom is a big enough character to warrant his own film with Spider-Man. If we had done that, maybe three and four would be looked at favorably as opposed to now where everybody either forgets three or they don't really care about it. So, like, I I think there's some good performances here. It's just very excessive, very overindulgent. You can tell this is this is the movie Sam Raimi made unfettered by the studio. Like he's coming off of two smash hits and they're like, you know, whatever you want to do, Sam, you're the boss. And Sam's idea is, all right, musical numbers up the wazoo. Like, we, Dunce, Dunce, you getting two numbers, totally <laughs> dancing shoes, because this is what America wants from a Spider-Man movie. And no, it turns out that what America wants from a Spider-Man movie is Spider-Man. <laughs> exactly. I, I will give Sam Raimi credit for one thing, which is my final note, is that bringing Bruce Campbell back yes. in the French restaurant is just a yes. beautiful thing. You know, Sam Raimi, Hallmark, all the way, all the way back to the – Evil Dead and Army of Darkness days and you know just having Bruce Campbell be Bruce Campbell in the movie is just it's it's a high point of this movie I think. And he's doing like I'm excited for Doctor Strange because I feel like Sam Raimi left to his own devices can get a little weird but if you put Sam Raimi inside the context of the MCU that could be really really fun and exciting and yes Bruce Campbell will most likely get another check from Sam Raimi. <laughs> Which I love I love I love I love. Joe what about you any other thoughts? The last fast connection that I had was that we get a funeral scene where everybody's wearing black in this mm. and considering we're thinking about letty and stuff like that i was like oh this actually looks just like the letty funeral scene promise me brian no more funeral <laughs> <laughs> yeah, promise me spider-man and then the butler shows up actually sir <laughs> letty's, letty's not dead yet she's just lost her memory <laughs> oh no i better, better idea nate it's like you know only one more his and they point to the butler it's just like we got to kill the butler <laughs> and then we're out Wait, wait, don't you want to hear about Han? Like, how do you know so much, but <laughs> the um the other thing that was striking when I was watching this that doesn't relate to Fast and Furious is how much when James Franco gets half his face deformed, mm. the, the deformed half looks like Willem Dafoe. Mm. It looks like him, and it, like yeah. it's like between that 
and the makeup that he used for the disaster artist. He looks like Tommy Wiseau and <laughs> also Willem Dafoe at the same time. I was like, damn, dude, I don't know if I'm just seeing Franco or like what I'm seeing here. <laughs> You're tearing me apart, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I would love is that, you know, when I watch The Sopranos, there's that portrait that Tony commissions of himself, like, in the old general's outfit next yes. to the horse. I'm like, mm-hmm. I want that on my wall. I also want this, like, oil painting of Willem Dafoe as, yes. as Norman Osborn on my wall. Like, what is, is that, is that Willem Dafoe from Spider-Man? Like, yeah, it is. Like, just, <laughs> like, just him, like, in a suit, like, in a smoking jacket or whatever. Love yep. It. I know we have, like, a lot of Australian listeners. And as I was watching this, I was thinking, like, if you're not from America and you've never been to New York City... New York City has to just be all construction and jazz bars. <laughs> like, how many times do we see jazz bars in any movie about New York? I've never been to a New York jazz bar. Like, I'm sure they exist, but not like every fucking corner is a jazz bar. <laughs> well, you just need a cooler boyfriend to take you there. Mm. Apparently, like everybody's in in smoking jackets and always at a jazz bar. Like, what the fuck is going on here? So, yeah. <laughs> I know it's a it's something that happens in every Spider-Man movie. Like the mask either gets beat up or he takes it off in the middle of a fight. But it happens way too much in this film. And I don't know if that's just Toby saying like I've done three of these now and I don't feel like having this mask on all day but <laughs> his mask is off way too much in this film he has he has COVID fatigue in the movie he's like <laughs> I can't wear the mask all the time you're stepping <laughs> on my freedom movie I don't want to wear a mask <laughs> <laughs> I know that Topher Grace hated it because it took an hour to get the suit on, the Venom suit, Mm -hmm. and then four hours of makeup. So, like, I know it's probably a different procedure for Spider-Man, but, like, Mm -hmm. if it's anywhere near, like, you know, and they're doing this for three years for this movie, and he's done it for the last, say, like, seven years, like, yeah, I I wouldn't want to either. Be like, yeah, I prefer Peter. Like, let's just do a Peter (laughs) story. Yeah, I feel you. All right, you guys want to watch the trailer? Yes. So I searched Spider-Man 3 trailer on YouTube. This is the Sony Pictures Home Entertainment Spider-Man 3 2007 trailer. I, I have to pre-screen these now because we've, we've been fooled a couple times this lap. We've gotten, as far as I can tell, yeah. this is the real trailer. So if you guys want to queue it up, I'll count it down. I got to queue it up watch whenever it you're ready. Like. All right. Because I know that the first Spider-Man trailer is memorable because the original trailer had him putting a web between the Twin Towers to like flag uh, or like to capture... A helicopter mm-hmm. and then you know nine after 9 11 they took that out and they redid the trailer but that mm-hmm. original trailer still exists do either of you have any memories of this trailer or is this one that just sort of forgotten no. to time forgotten to time for sure yeah. for like I don't, I don't like i remember two because i think two had the train like the great train sequence in the trailer but i don't remember this trailer like watching it today was the first time I'd seen this trailer in years. This The, the Amazing Spider-Man 1, I feel like the, the, the school bus thing at the end was probably in the trailer. In, in Amazing Spider-Man 2, the Jamie Foxx's Electro stuff. Which, like I, I remember like what are probably trailer moments, but I have no idea what this will contain. So let us watch it together and talk about it. All right, three, two, one, play. Oh, shit. <laughs> Good shot of New York. This is pretty menacing already. Yeah. I do like it's Spider-Man so parties. Those are cool. <laughs> the first time we see Spider-Man swing through the city, it's like, it's Peter, right? Like, he's running away, which goes to the fact that he just never wants to be in costume. Yeah. yeah. And he also, like, look here. And he's, like, spider manning without a costume there, too. I think I can. Uh, I remember what it was like to have an old Aunt May. <laughs> oh, by the way, she plays... Marissa Tomei's like mother-in-law in Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. So there's two enemies in that one. And just, you know. So what you're saying is that's the prequel to uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. <laughs> <laughs> when, whenever we got Marissa Tomei, I was like, I can never go back. I know. <laughs> that's it. I'm done. That was she's my good I know she's not <laughs> true. It's like a poison. You know, there's been a lot of, like, the New York Times just put out a thing about, like, determining your COVID bubble size for Thanksgiving and everything. Yep. And, uh, it just, in, in this, I'm, like, wondering, like, how big Spider-Man, like, who knows Peter Parker's Spider-Man bubble? Because, like, it's getting it's getting untenably big. Like, so many people know yep. he's Spider-Man. Like, it feels, it's it's reaching dangerous levels right now. Exactly, yeah. He's getting to the end. That would have been oh, the next movie. Oh, great, ladies and gentlemen. What does it matter to you anyway? We had a subway fight, too, by the way, which is yep. very fast and furious. Yep. Getting sandblasted would not be fun. You know, this feels like a lot in this trailer, but it also seems kind of cool. Uh, that's a great yeah, this, shot right the, there. The trailer is doing a good sell. 
That shot with him looking in the in the uh, window was great. We have to forgive each other. Oh, I think that's like that, that's like the main poster too for this. Like that, yeah. they, they capitalized on that for sure. I have to stop it. I was really confused. I thought that Spider-Man was going to turn into Venom in this one, from like what I remember. Mm. But he kind of does. He's just like Dark Spider-Man, I guess, in the black suit. Yeah. Because yeah. I was like, Rachel, is Venom going to show up, or is he Venom? Like, what part of this? And she's like, Oh no, like Venom does show up. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Once you go black. <laughs> the trailer makes it seem like his transformation to Dark Spider-Man is like the main thing in this movie, yes. which it is very not is at all. Not. No. There was not. far less Topher Grace in this trailer than we actually received in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> the final game to play, we're going to play the letterbox game, which, Nate, I know this is, I think, your first time playing this. Ooh. It's very difficult, so if you do not do well, it is... Do not feel bad, because this is wildly difficult for everybody. I don't even know how Joe gets as close as he does. But, for reference sake... Mad Max Fury Road, one of the most popular films on Letterboxd, has been seen by 670,000 people. 670,000. Mm -hmm. cool. 670, Spider-Man 3, from 2007, directed by Sam Raimi, starring Tobey Maguire, Kirsten Dunst, James Franco, Thomas Hayden Church, Topher Grace, and Bryce Dallas Howard, has been seen by how many people? Nate, you want to mm. go first or second, bud? I'll go first. I'll go first. Because as we've talked about, fellas, like this isn't a great movie, but I feel like, yeah, like you don't make that much money without a lot of people seeing it. Uh, sure. It's obviously an influential movie. I think the entire cast of Glee watched it, and that's what inspired them to become uh, young performers. So I'm going to say <laughs> I'm just, I'm just picturing a, a young Grant Gustin like studying all of Tobey Maguire's moves. Like, I've got it now. <laughs> Dig on this, mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, since this is the third Spider-Man, let's say 300,000. Okay, Joe? I'm going to go 56. Ooh. Nate is way closer, but you are both too low. Mm, really? Wow. Damn. Got to go higher than 300. Okay, yeah, because I think like a lot of people have seen this movie. Let's say 450. Uh, 365. You know, Joe, you are very close. I want to make sure I get this, this lyric right. Um, uh -oh. 369, damn she fine. <laughs> I'm hoping she can sock it to me one more time. Get low. 369,000 mm. people. 369,000. Mm. Wow. 369, so, you know, Nate, for your first guess of 300, not, you were not very far close. off. I think it was well, close enough all, to win both showcases. Oh, I appreciate it because, uh, you know, again, like you mentioned that song lyric, it, it, it ties into Spider Man because we know Spider Man was on the windows and he was on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> the walls. And yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the web dropped down and fall. <laughs> Till all these goblins oh, crawl. <laughs> if you can consider, like, him shooting the webs is skeet skeet. Like, that's the yes, Oh, my right? God. So, oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Is Get Low about Spider-Man? It might be. Mm. Like, that's what should have been the end. Like, granted, it wasn't out yet, but that should have been the closing song for this film. When Peter and Mary oh. J are having that sentimental moment. It's to the windows. <laughs> 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 so we got three Sandman songs and we got Get Low and that's the movie's yeah. fixed completely fixed you're welcome Sam Raimi okay <laughs> so of those 369,000 people average rating of 2.65 most common a 3 then a 2 Ooh. then a 2.5 how many of those people have put this movie in their top 4 their 4 favorite movies of all time Let's see Sam Raimi Bruce Campbell it's weird because it, it could be either like way low or way high yeah Gotta be low. I'll let you go first. I'm thinking it's gonna be like twenty five at the most. Okay, okay. I'll go a little bit higher because I do think there are some people that swear by the first Spider Man trilogy. And I'll say forty forty six for no reason at all. You both gotta go higher. You are under wow. underestimating the love for Spider Man. Oh, <laughs> Seventy five. I'm going to drop it back down and, and uh, tie into the last answer. Let's go 68. Still got to go higher. One wow. more message. 115, 115, and that's ridiculous. I, I can't believe if it's if it's that high. You know what? Let's, let's, let's shoot for the stars. I'll say 200. 207. 200. Wow. Seven people <laughs> have this in their top four. And I spent so long last night finding an account that works because, like, the thing to keep in mind is a lot of people have in their top four – Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man Spider -Man 3. 3. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of those people. That's not very interesting to play in this game, but we're going to find, we're going to go to HMZ period at HMZ ACR on Letterboxd. 
Okay. Five star review. Well, I guess everyone must already know what I'm going to say. I don't even know why it's my favorite because it's not perfect and even me can admit it. But anyway, my love for this film is endless and will remain until the end of the world. Yesterday, mm. I had an erection of over two hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I won't explain about the why, the why I adore it so much mm. because it would take hours. Anyway, it's my favorite end. Once again, this movie is my entire life. And once again, if one day Spider-Man 3 has no ally anymore, then it means I'm dead. 10 out of 10. Wow. Five stars. <laughs> Somebody really fucking loves this movie. Okay. Wow. So Spider-Man 3 on his profile is his fourth favorite movie of all time. His top three are all Oscar winning movies. And then there's Spider-Man 3. (laughs) Two fairly recently. And then one from the 70s. Number two. Here's a hint. Number two is a movie that also takes place in New York. Mm. And also features a Gwen Stacy and stars a different Spider-Man movies villain in the lead role. Hmm. Interesting. That's a lot of clues. Jake Gyllenhaal, I'm guessing. Something with Jake Gyllenhaal and Gwen's... I don't know what else she's in, though. New York City. Mm -hmm. A different Gwen Stacy is in this. And a different Spider-Man villain is in this. Is it Perks of Being a Wallflower? No. This movie also, big hint, won Best Picture. Oh. Won Best um, Picture. In no, maybe not. No, maybe not. Maybe not. It was nominated for Best Picture. I don't think yeah. it won Best Picture. I think I lost. <laughs> so we got a La La Land Moonlight situation. If I remember right, and I'm going to look this up right now, I think this was like wildly... Oh, no, it did win Best Picture. Oh, and recently? Okay. Yep. What were some of the recent... Birdman? Birdman. Birdman, yeah, or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, oh. yep. is number two favorite movie. You got Michael Keaton yep, from... Yep, yep. Homecoming. Yep. And you've got Emma Stone from The Amazing Spider-Man. Okay. Perfect. Good yeah. clues. Number three, the title thematically ties in to the title of the previous movie. Ties into Birdman, kind of wildly different movie from the 70s. Also features a superhero movie villain in the lead role. Mm. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Bingo. Nailed nice. it. Nice. Oh, yes. <laughs> you got birds oh. and you got Joker. Nice. Oh, wow. And his favorite movie was nominated for Best Picture, did not win, came out in the 2000s. Mm-hmm. Okay. How can I tie this at all to superhero movies? I don't think that I can. It's based on a book, hmm. a mm. book called Oil. There Will Be Blood. There will be blood. Ooh, Nailed it. Nice. I had a good run on those guessing yeah. today. I was on it. <laughs> there will be blood. Birdman. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Spider-Man three. Four of the greatest films. Wow. That have ever <laughs> on screen. I put on. I put on. There will be blood the other day when we were cooking, and Rachel's like, "What is this movie?" And I was like, "It's very long. It's beautiful, but I will never make you actually watch it." So. Scored by Johnny Greenwood of Radiohead. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. That's a cool fact. Well, Nate, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, anything you want to plug, if you want to talk about your podcast, any more rants about the musical numbers you want to get off your chest, <laughs> hit, us, hit the audience with whatever you want to do here at the end of the show. Yes, I mean, I'm glad, because I, I feel like the audience probably had collective amnesia trying to recall things about Spider-Man 3, so I'm glad we were able to jog their memory. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to come to this conclusion, fellas, and, and again, like, it's not a perfect movie, but if, if you're bored and need something to watch, it's enjoyable, I, I guess. Uh, <laughs> are you saying Are you saying you didn't have a two and a half hour erection during this film? I, I did not. I did not. Okay. Only when JJ popped up, You're like, oh, <laughs> this, this newspaper stuff. This hits the spot right here. <laughs> that's the other thing. Like that's how long ago this movie was because newspapers were such a thriving industry that even the Bugle could uh, operate. Sure. It. <laughs> and survive. This movie did come out when I was in college to become a newspaper reporter, and newspapers died while I was getting my degree. Mm. So this is in the mm. the golden hour of newspapers before they're like, nope, everything's online. Mm. Yep. So you really empathize with Eddie Brock's predicament in the film. Let's... Oh, for sure. 100%. <laughs> so yeah, I, I appreciate you guys uh, having me on the show again and then love having you talking brother. about this film. Uh, you know, I just want to say, like, Joey and Joe, if, if if everybody else leaves and you don't have an ally, as long as I'm alive, <laughs> you'll, you'll have one ally in, in me. Thank you, brother. Like, the only thing I love better than Too Fast, Too Forever is One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful thing. <laughs> 
Um, but if you want to hear more from me, audience, and you want to hear uh, in particular more from the Joes, then you're in luck because January 2021, how good does it feel to say those numbers? 2021, yes, get out of here. Uh, yeah. the first episode of the Rocky My Idea Picture Show over at Post Wrestling will be myself, uh, the Joes, and maybe a, a special guest or two. And we'll be talking about one of the uh, most emotional entries into the Fast Saga. Oof. Fast and Furious 7. So uh, the guys have been on. If you haven't checked out the show, head over to Post Wrestling. The guys have been on episodes talking about Fast 5 and also uh, Fast and Furious 6 uh, because the show is uh, about the the film work, the filmography, the catalog of Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And so uh, it'll be fun having you guys back on and kicking off the uh, show for a brand new year. And we can let all of 2020 just exist in the past fellas amen so you can check that out at post wrestling you can check out the kings of sport uh we do have a patreon so while you're signing up for the uh too fast too forever patreon you might as well Thank just you. take a stroll you know take a take a toby mcguire-esque stroll through patreon <laughs> and and uh hit up the kings of sport patreon.com backslash king sport five bucks gets you in the door right now we've got over a hundred hours of content uh, up there, audio That's and video. Wild. This week, we're dropping our very first uh, movie live watch. Uh, and it's going to be myself, uh, Brittany Monet, and uh, Vanessa Shark from the Black Lightning podcast. Uh, also, like, terrible news about Black Lightning this week, but that's a conversation for another day. The CW, get your act together. We did a live watch of Hamilton. Ooh. Nice. And so, yeah, it's two hours of, because Brittany's like a Hamilton super fan. I'm a new convert to the congregation, and mm-hmm. Vanessa's only watching it because we pestered her for three months into watching this film. And <laughs> so, like, we, we had a good time. So it's uh, us watching and singing and dropping various, like, we, we do some fan casting. And, uh, yeah, two two hours of uh, uh, just a celebration. I'm thinking about putting that uh, episode out for free on the Patreon. It's kind of a holiday treat for everybody because mm. I know we've all had a tough year. So we need Definitely. all the good stuff we can get. Uh, so that'll be free probably. Uh, but then if you want to you know, contribute and show your appreciation, you can subscribe to the Patreon for five bucks. You can find me on Twitter at in the number eight, M-O-Z-A-I-K, at Nate Mosaic. And there you'll find links to like the other 30 shows I do. Because, you know, I think this is where I, I feel a bit of a kinship with Sam Raimi, Joey. And then like, I just, like, I get all these ideas and I just can't say no. So, like, a normal person would have stopped at two podcasts, maybe three. But I got, like, five, six, seven of them going at one time. So, like, I, I appreciate Sam's uh, enthusiasm. But, you know, like, maybe we just need people to kind of rein us in from time to time. <laughs> well, you know what they say, Nate, the podcasters, they get the job done. Mm. Oh, Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Like, here's the thing. And I, and I hate to say it like this, but... Like a lot, there's a lot of good podcasters out there. I don't want to pat myself on the back too much, but like Kevin Smith, like Kevin Smith did five podcasts. Uh, somebody like Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan did 29 podcasts. Yeah, but Brother Nate, the man you're listening to right now, Brother Nate did the other 51. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm nonstop. <laughs> I love it. Oh, also, also, I uh, I'm doing a voice uh, voice work now because my friend told me like why are you wasting that instrument of yours like make money with it uh so i've just started doing uh, voice voiceovers and uh you know voice work for people so uh if you'd like to get this voice on kind of represent your brand your non i've done work for nonprofits over the last couple months uh schools uh businesses if you got a podcast that you need some imaging for uh you can hit me up on uh twitter right now because i don't have like a professional fancy voice acting website or anything like that yet but you can hit me up on twitter at in the number eight m-o-z-a-i-k and you can get this voice right here for a reasonable rate for your next project love it awesome dude that's really awesome you know i do want to give you one separate from all of that uh Mm. one rocky mayavia tip we are the episode that comes out immediately before this one we're doing hobbs and shaw of course you know you're familiar you know Hobbs. we watch the deleted scenes and there is a lot of backstory that you get about our man dwayne the rock rocky rock 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 johnson aka lucas rebecca hobbs lucas rebecca hobbs yeah i I, I had my brain i was like that sounds wrong but yeah lucas rebecca hobbs a lot of backstory in there so if you want more on the Blu-ray, there's like 35 minutes of deleted scenes, a lot of Hobbs backstory, some interaction. So mm. if you've not seen that yet, check it out because it's it more so than any other movie. We get more about The Rock and the Hobbs character in this one. Mm-hmm. So as a Hobbs, as a Dwayne Johnson super fan, 
highly recommend that you check that one out. Uh, I, will. I will. I'll, I'll make sure I have my Thunderwear ready for that one. You'll love it. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, Joe, next week, we've got a, another themed week. We are doing throwback week to two classic films that I have Ooh. not seen before. What are they? On Tuesday, we are going way back to 1945. This sounds like a joke. <laughs> it is not a joke. We're going back to 1945 Ooh. to cover the film Spellbound. Okay. Ooh. Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. Oh, a long big Hitchcock fan. I've never seen Spellbound, but I've seen a bunch of the other ones. So Then... We jump ahead a couple decades to 1966 Ooh. to talk about John Frankenheimer's Seconds, S-E-C-O-N-D-S, Seconds, both Ooh. pretty famous, pretty well-regarded Ooh. movies, neither of which I have seen. Neither have I seen either. Supposedly deal with memory loss, so we'll see what's going on there. But if not, we'll just watch two good old movies next week. That's Throwback cool. week, Spellbound, and Seconds next week on Too Fast, Too Forever. Works for me. But for all things Too Fast, Too Forever, you go to cageclub.me. Facebook.com slash Too Fast Too Forever or at Too Fast Too Forever on Twitter and Instagram. Email us, family at cageclub.me. Check out our Patreon page at Too Fast Too Forever.com. Then head over to patreon.com slash Kings of Sport Pod to check out Nate and his Hamilton three hour watch along. Like if you want 103 hours of content, yeah. go check yes. that out because uh, lots of good stuff going on over there. Have a happy Thanksgiving weekend. Today is Black Friday. Shop safely. Shop What's remotely. my anniversary then? <laughs> Yes, happy anniversary, Joe, to you and Rachel. Yeah, uh, Black congratulations Friday, anniversary. to the two of you. And uh, we'll Aww. see you next time on Throwback Week. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Joe, too. And that was Nate Milton of the other 51 podcasts. And we'll tell you all about it when we see you.